in fact, large-scale change. Like Hendon, there are places in America where the numbers of prisons built is determined by the number of Latino and African-American children that are born. The life trajectory for these young people is best described as the cradle to prison pipeline. The term emerged to describe the overwhelming odds stacked against kids born in economically depressed areas with high levels of poverty and challenges that curtail the ch chances for success. The striving to advance knowledge regarding research, policy, and practical efforts to reduce crime in America, most violent cities, cities we hope that this discussion this morning will spark an important exchange. This event has been possible with the support from the Chancellor's Office, the Center for Urban Research and Education, the Center for Community Leadership, and the University Office for Diversity and Inclusion from New Brunswick. This is an important topic for the work happening on this campus. Let me invite our Dean, Christy Linda Meyer, to welcome you on behalf of our faculty and students and on behalf of the whole campus community. Thank you very much for being here. Of course, we're very honored to have Marion Wright Edelman here, but our other speakers um, are also uh, honoring us with their presence on this campus where we focus on success uh, and certainly making higher education opportunities available to a diverse group in society. So this is a priority for Rutgers Camden. It's something we identify with every day. We have the only PhD program in childhood studies in North America that has actually graduated students, and we're very proud of that. And last May, we had three successful graduates from that program. We have many other departments that focus their interest in on providing uh, research that will be helpful in creating success paths for um, young people and children all across America and around the world. So thank you so much for being here. And I know we're gonna hear some interesting uh, research today that will help us all make this uh, the trajectory that is not only Rutgers Camden identity, but something that the United States can also be proud of. Thank you. You know, we have very little funding for these projects, but you know, one of the things that I believe in is, is that when there's an opportunity, there's funding, and so I knew that I needed some funding for this project, um, and I'm so grateful to the Office of Diversity for the Rutgers University for coming through at the last minute for me. Let me introduce Dr. Jorge Chemin, our Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion, who brings remarks on behalf of the university president. Privilege and pleasure to be here and to bring you a welcome on behalf of President Barchi. As you may or may not know, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion for the university is um, not even a year old. Uh, this is our year of identity. This is our year in which we are uh, pulling together uh, the agenda for the coming years. And one of our first items was to support Gloria and the program because we're great admirers of, uh, of what she's done um, and what she still has to do. Um, a brief um, uh, note on diversity at Rutgers. You may know uh, Rutgers University in general is among the most diverse universities uh, in the United States. Um, in terms of the mix of students, it is the most diverse uh, in the United States. Um, but more than that, um, it has more programs focusing on some aspect of diversity than any other university. It is a, a great accomplishment, um, something we're proud of. We are promoting in our office a new social contract for the university and a social contract that says if you come here, whether you're faculty, student, or staff, if you come here to Rutgers, we will accept you for who you are, <coughs> period. Just as we expect you to accept others. Um, and with that beginning, we think um, we can achieve the kind of inclusiveness that allows students and others to feel safe to speak their minds because when they do, uh, we are all much better off. So, um, on with the show. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. We're delighted that we were able to be co-sponsors. So, let me now introduce our distinguished panel. Dr. Heather Thompson will open the discussion with a general contextual understanding about the crisis of urban youth and its overpopulation in America <laughs> prisons. Through her research and the cultural historical implications of mass incarceration, she will be able to shed some light and relevance to this epidemic. She calls this a racialized crisis that finds its origins on the backlash to the civil rights movement. 
She will be followed by Scott Charles and Dr. A.B. Goldberg from the Cradle to Pray program at Temple University. This program was established to educate young people about the physical, emotional, and social consequences of gun violence, while providing them an unflinching glimpse with the clinical aspects of this public health crisis. Our featured speaker, Ms. Marion Bright Edelman, will close the discussion. We're looking forward to hearing Ms. Bright Edelman's perspective as the founder and president of the Children's Defense Fund. Heard on behalf of, of children is well known and has been the catalyst in launching national crusades to protect our most vulnerable children. She has been an important voice for children and for influencing policy at the highest level to shift the ways in which our government and the private sector deals with children and youth that are growing up disconnected from, from prosperity. Her National Cradle to Prison Pipeline campaign to reduce detention and incarceration of youth has set this epidemic at the national stage. We're honored to have her here today. This, on. this is so incredibly important, as is the LEAP program, and uh, I know that you're all here because you already know that. <laughs> you already know how important this issue is. And um, nevertheless, I'm the historian on the panel, so I get to, uh, I guess, remind us why this issue is so important and to give us a sense of what we're dealing with. And um, so what I've decided to do is to title my remarks, essentially, Why Mass Incarceration Matters. And that is to give us a sense of how do we connect the fact that we are in the world's largest prison crisis right now with this uh, problem, crisis of youth violence and the kind of traumas that our uh, esteemed physicians on the other side of the table get to deal with every single day and what so many community members and citizens of this state in the state I live in, right across the, the river, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, deal with. So what I want to do is to actually just begin by reminding us again why mass incarceration matters. And the first thing I want to say is it matters because it is absolutely historically unprecedented. That is to say, we have the largest criminal justice system in the entire world. This graphic, we don't even have time to pick it apart this morning. But if you're interested, I'm happy to share any of these uh, uh, images with you later. But what you can quickly see is we have more than seven and a half million people in this system in some form or fashion. One in 31 US residents under some form of correctional control by 2007. Now in my state, this literally meant, well, let me back it up, in my state this literally meant that by 2011 we had 52,000 people in prison and 350,000 people in the system in some form or fashion. So needless to say, this means that we are a world outlier. It doesn't matter what country you pick, we have done what no other country has done in terms of locking up its population. As importantly, we know that this population is overwhelmingly racialized, right? We've heard the statistics. We know how many youth from the moment they are born are targeted for, destined for, this criminal justice system. And yet, we don't spend hardly enough time as citizens, as voters, as community members trying to figure out how we might dismantle this, although I think that's really changing. So just to give a little background, mass incarceration matters because we've never had, at, had it at the scale, no other country has it at the scale, but it also matters, oh and by the way, this has to do with the racialization. You ever wonder why it's so racialized? Look at these data from just marijuana arrests. You know, pick out, you can just see where I live, Pennsylvania. Um, you know, who gets targeted for the same behaviors it has a lot to do with who ends up, right, in the criminal justice system. But it also matters, not just because of its scope, not just because of its size, and not just because we've never had it this large. It matters because in many respects we didn't need to do it. And this is where the historian, uh, the historical stuff comes in. Believe it or not, most people think that, well actually, we, look, believe that most people think that we began this war on crime that led to mass incarceration because we were experiencing these catastrophic crime rates across the nation, right? And it turns out that that's actually not the case. We begin the war on crime, not actually with Nixon even, with Lyndon Johnson in 1965 with something called the Law Enforcement Administration Act, which creates the apparatus that we can have a war on crime. But guess what? We begin it in 1965, and if you look at this graph, there's something pretty striking about 1965, which is that it doesn't necessarily have the highest <coughs> homicide rate. Indeed, it really didn't. Now, crime is going to start to go up, so I'll make that point in a minute. But for now, just remember, we start this war on crime before 
therefore we have a catastrophic crime rate, crime rise. Why? Well, this, the reasons are complex, but in no small part we have it because when the civil rights movement comes north, northern politicians start to interpret urban unrest and urban disorder in the same way that the southern politicians have been doing for some time, which is to say it was crime, it was criminal. It was something that we needed to rein in with greater law enforcement acts, right? And so when Philly ends up um, in, in absolute turmoil because African Americans actually want civil rights to mean something and take to the streets, or in Harlem or in Rochester, the response to this is to pour enormously new amounts of funding into policing and to essentially begin this war on crime. So this matters, by the way, because we've done this before. This is something historically interesting. Right after the Civil War, we had four million newly freed African Americans who also thought, yeah, freedom should really mean something, democracy should really mean something. And white Southerners responded to this by criminalizing black spaces in all new ways, right? All of a sudden making things illegal that hadn't been illegal before, having greater penalties for things that had been illegal before. And pretty soon, the black population of the South goes from being freed in one minute to newly locked up in the next. The Georgia State Penitentiary, for example, in 1860 is all white. By 1890, it's all black. But not because white folks stopped committing crime and black folks lost their mind. It had to do with the public policy decision, right? How we understood crime, what we did about crime, okay? So this is exactly what happens after 1960. <coughs> so it matters because we didn't need to do it. That's the first thing. It starts to have enormous effects though, right? Because what do you notice about the violent crime rate? When we are in the midst of the war on crime, when we're at the top of the war on crime, we get the worst violent crime rates ever. And I'll just, just hold that and we'll talk about it. Mass incarceration matters because in fact, it erodes communities and it frays families. Now this seems kind of counterintuitive because the whole point of the war on crime, right, was to make families safer. It was supposed to make people feel safer. And yet we know that with targeted policing, we know something very important. We know that entire neighborhoods collapse. This is Philadelphia. And if you, if we don't have time to really unpack this map, but the one thing you'll notice about it is the extraordinarily concentrated levels of incarceration in certain pockets. And if you, what's laid over here is where the schools are and how well they're doing. And you notice something really profound, which is that the neighborhoods with the worst and highest levels of con concentrated incarceration are also the most in trouble when it comes to educational success and everything else. We know that it matters because it has frayed our families. It has concentrated our employment. It, uh, it, it has concentrated incarceration in such a way that we get something called million-dollar blocks. You know, when you drive down the street and it looks like everything's destroyed. Well, that's because most people living there actually aren't living there anymore. They've been pulled out into one of the state prison systems. So we know it orphans children. Upwards of 10 million children now have some caretaker that's involved in the criminal justice system. We know it destroys schools, right? So we know that this really matters. And it matters <coughs> because we have a concentration where it didn't need to be. We also know that it matters for our public health, and our doctors will talk about this, because it creates an intensified violence at the community level. It also, by the way, creates a health crisis because when you have so many people in prison, you've got concentrations of TB, you've got concentrations of MRSA, you've got all kinds of things. It also matters because it has undermined our economy, which in turn undermines our communities, right? When you've got 65 million people with some form of criminal record, it means that they're virtually unemployable, right? So mass incarceration has undermined our economy both by essentially rendering people unemployable, but also taking jobs out of the free world and putting them into prisons where the prisoners aren't making any money, the workers on the outside aren't making any money, Someone's making money, but it's no one who needs the money, which is people in the communities, right? So just in short, what I want to say is that mass incarceration matters because it destroys our communities, it erodes our families, it destroys our economy, and by the way, it distorts our very democracy. You may wonder why it is that something this devastating has been so hard to change, right? If we know these laws are bad, why has it been so difficult for us to overhaul them? Why has it been so hard for the people most affected by these policies to do something about them? 
Well, this also goes back to the past. These are not the slides I wanted, which is why I'm a little discombobulated. I apologize. But this also goes back to the past, because after the Civil War, not only did we criminalize space in new ways and lock up people at, at, for, for uh, crimes that hadn't been crimes before and for longer times for previous crimes, but we also put them to work in convict leasing, and we took away their right to vote. After 1965, we do the same thing. We criminalize urban spaces in new ways. We then put people to work, but not to make any money to bring it back to their communities. And we take away their right to vote. In 1974, we test this at the Supreme Court level. We say it's perfectly OK to disfranchise people with a criminal justice record. And by 2006, 48 out of 50 states have some form of felon disfranchisement on the records, right? On the books. So that matters because it means that when we're thinking about mandatory minimums, when we're thinking about these kinds of things, we can't change them if we can't vote anymore, right? Well, we can't through grassroots activism, and I'm sure we'll talk about that too. But it makes the democratic process a very difficult place to assess this war on crime. The other thing is, of course, we have the census problem. In the United States, people are counted where they're locked up, not where they live. So this means, right, that your votes are no longer in the communities where you come from if you're incarcerated. They're given to the community where you were locked up. This also has a 19th century corollary, right? Have you ever heard of the three-fifths clause? Remember where black bodies who couldn't vote were used for white political power? Quite frankly, that's exactly what has happened. This is my state in Pennsylvania. Eight house districts would not exist if it weren't for the padding they get from prisoners who themselves cannot vote, right? And census population doesn't just result in representation, it also adds up to money, right? Resources, childhood nutrition programs, things back in the communities at home. New Jersey has the same problem. There's also serious prison gerrymandering in New Jersey. So where does this all leave us? This all leaves us with, it matters because we have just created the conditions for urban violence. Here's something very ironic. Over the last few years, the violent crime rate in America has gone down pretty dramatically. And in fact, so much so that it's led people to think maybe mass incarceration actually works. Kind of secretly, people wonder that. Well, first I'm here to tell you, we know scientifically that the incarceration rate's gone like this over the last 40 years. The crime rate is disaggregated from it, right? The crime rate comes and goes completely independent of the incarceration rate. So that's not why. Crime rates are very difficult to understand why they go up and down, but nevertheless, the violent crime rate overall has gone down, and yet, guess what? In our most fragile, our already most fragile communities, violence is catastrophic right now. And that's not accidental. And you're gonna hear about what that looks like on the ground, but what you need to understand is that this is because the, cre the conditions have been created for violence, right? You destroy communities, you orphan children, you hyper-police areas such as schools and, and playgrounds and pretty much everywhere anyone ever walks and breathes. And then you have a drug war, right, that makes things illegal that now have a high price tag attached to them, right, which then makes things like guns all of a sudden something everyone feels like they need to have for self-protection. You just begin to see the, the, all of the elements come together for a horrendous violence problem. So in short, mass incarceration is criminogenic. It creates the conditions that create violence. So if we're serious about public safety, which I know we all are, we need to do everything we can. Programs like LEAP absolutely pick up the most important threads of this by giving people education and making sure they're connected back to community and college all the way through. But we also need to recognize, if we're serious about public safety, we've got to figure out a different way to deal with crime. We've got to figure out a different way to deal with violence than what we're doing, because what we're doing is creating the conditions that actually ensure violence and actually erode families so that they're very weakened to be able to resist these very forces that we dislike so much and we hope to change. So I've given you a huge overview here, and I'm happy to take questions, but thank you. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, I, I know that you guys are scholars, and I love seeing this. 
it, it, it makes me feel um, thrilled and hopeful. Um, but I also hope that you feel like soldiers. I hope that when you do what you do with your lives, that you will come back and you will save us and you will save the communities that sent you out there. When I was a young uh, person, a young man, I had become addicted to drugs. And as a recovering drug addict, I was working for a family newspaper in Sacramento, California, uh, a black newspaper. Uh, and I didn't have any skills. Uh, I had very little talent. And my aunt and uncle who ran the newspaper entrusted me with doing things like sweeping up. And then as I discovered that I could do a little bit of what we called layout and paste up back then, this is nothing you'd understand because this was before computers, I, they put me in front of a, a layout board and they gave me <coughs> columns to, to paste up. And as a young man trying to discover his way and figure out what he was meant to do with his life, I was entrusted with laying out this article, uh, these columns every week, one of which was written by a woman named Mary Wright Edelman. And as I sat there trying to figure out who I could be and what I should be, I would read her uh, articles and her columns, and often I didn't understand the words that were in them, and I would take the time to look up these words. Um, and I discovered that my destiny was much greater than I had believed it to be until that point. And so if I get emotional up here, I apologize, because my life has brought me full circle, and I'm standing up here to marry my everyone. So in, true, in the truest form, and I hope you understand this in the, the spirit in which it is intended, that woman over there is an OG. Uh, I don't care who you know in your life that you think is uh, courageous. Uh, do yourself a favor and look up Marion Wright Edelman when you get home, and you will see the definition of OG. Um, we'll make an so, My life brought me full circle. Um, I'm originally from California, and I was working with uh, former gang members not long after I left the newspaper. And then eventually I found my way to Philadelphia. And I was working with young people here in Philadelphia when uh, I was invited to bring them to Temple University Hospital, a hospital in the heart of North Philadelphia uh, that was known uh, for having treated the most gunshot patients of any other hospital in the state of Pennsylvania. And I called up there, and I was put in touch with a woman uh, by the name of Dr. Amy Goldberg. And the person on the phone said, this woman is incredibly passionate about young people being shot. Um, and I said, well, great. I'd love to meet her. And we spoke on the phone briefly, and she said, I have to tell you, I'm excited that you're bringing young people to the hospital to show them what we do here. Because a lot of times, the first time they're understanding what gun injury is is when they've suffered gun injury. I want them to come in as students, not as patients. But I can't tell you how disappointed I'll be if this is the first and only time that we do this. Um, little did I know that that woman would then stalk me for weeks and months <laughs> until I agreed to join the hospital. And it's been my great pleasure for the last eight and a half years uh, to be. So I'm going to uh, kick off um, our presentation. Again, I echo Scott's comments. We are incredibly honored uh, to be here today and participating. Um, and uh, I don't think any of them are going to believe that this little petite white Jewish woman from the suburbs is gangster. <laughs> <laughs> you are in trouble. Um, Temple University Hospital is in the heart of uh, North Philadelphia. Uh, we see about 3,000 trauma patients per year um, and about 900 penetrating trauma patients. And penetrating trauma are those patients that have sustained gunshot wounds or stab wounds. And of those 900, uh, over half of them, about 500, are patients that have sustained gunshot injuries. And of those people being shot, half of the gunshot wound patients are of the age of 25 and younger. Now, I grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia in Brew Mall, which was south and west of the city. And I can tell you, I didn't know from North Philly, and I didn't know from gun violence. And when I arrived in North Philadelphia Temple Hospital in 1987, I, I hate to say the year, but when I arrived in 1987, I got a really big education. And I assure you, the education was not just on medicine and not just on surgery. It was really what was going on in our city that really was not being told. So uh, during my five years as a general surgery resident, we rotated on the trauma service. And I particularly remember uh, in January 1991, I was a fourth year surgical resident uh, on the trauma surgery service. And it was really kind of at the heart of Desert Storm, you know, one of the Gulf Wars was January 1991. 
And uh, I remember one week, now January's our winter months, and usually our shootings go down during our winter months. But I particularly remember this one week in January, I saw more young black men shot in the head that died that week than any of the casualties of the war during that week. And I'm by no means minimizing any of our military casualties. I am not. But I would go home and realize I was kind of watching two wars. I was participating in a war in North Philadelphia that really nobody seemed to know about, and probably worse yet, nobody seemed to care about. And then I would go home and I would watch on CNN for the very first time in January 1991 in Baghdad, you know, bombs dropping. And I was getting incredibly frustrated and very confused because I couldn't understand why people weren't outraged by that. And here are just some numbers that reflect. And again, by no means am I uh, minimizing the significance of our military deaths. But during that time period of the Desert Storm, there were 294 deaths. During that exact same time period in Philadelphia, there were 472 homicides. And CNN wasn't covering it. And we weren't hearing about it. Now, I was very fortunate um, to leave North Philadelphia and go down to Baltimore, Maryland for a trauma fellowship. So I spent a year at Shock Trauma doing a trauma fellowship. And in August, I really experienced this uh, sentinel case that I saw on a Sunday night. So August, summer, we expect gunshot wound. Sunday night, we don't. 16 years old, I really don't. It was a Sunday night, and a 16-year-old young man came in, a boy, and he was shot and he died in the trauma bay. And you know, I did everything I was trained to do and you know, miraculously and of course, uh, more with God's help than anything, we saved this uh, young person. And embarrassingly, I was really proud of myself. Very, very proud of myself. Um, and not really understanding why I would become embarrassed. And ultimately, he left the hospital and I saw him in the clinic. And I had said to him, you know, it was kind of a Thursday in the middle of the day, and I was like, well, aren't you in school? And he was like, no, I'm not in school. And I then realized that my operation was really pretty insignificant, that in, in really the long look of life, I'm not really so sure I had extended his life expectancy. I had patched him up and sent him back out into the community, the very community that got him shot. And I was overcome with embarrassment that I was kind of celebrating my success of taking care of him in the hospital but I really didn't uh, ensure that he was going to go to college and he was going to graduate and he was going to change his life. Um, and that was a real eye-opening for me. So as I said, I got to uh, Temple Hospital in 1987 and these are, this is just some data from January 1, 1988 to the present. So this is about six months after I arrived in North Philadelphia. And there have been 7,500 gun deaths in Philadelphia during my time period in North Philadelphia. And these dots on this map represent deaths, gun deaths. They don't represent all the people that are getting shot. These are just the deaths. So from 2002 to 2013, more than 19,000 Philadelphians were shot. Now, the dots that we see on maps are dots on maps, but, but all these dots have faces, and all these dots are people. So who are these people that are being shot? Well, 80% of them are African Americans. 92% of the victims are men and 50% of gun victims were between the ages of 14 and 24. Now I assure you, I wasn't worried about getting shot when I was growing up uh, in Bruma, in my little suburb. So gun homicide is the leading cause of death for young African American men in Philadelphia. Black teens age 15 to 19 are 20 times more likely than their, white, than their white peers to be killed by a handgun during an assault. All things that I just never had to be challenged by. 
Between 2002 and 2011, nearly 1,200 Philadelphia shooting victims were 19 years old. We're just looking at 19 years old during that time period. So if you are not outraged by kind of the loss of our moral compass as a society, well, the financial numbers don't look so good either. But again, we shouldn't necessarily need the dollars that it's costing us to take care of patients to get our outrage. It should just be dots on maps that are people and real people. So until last year, at least 1,500 people have been shot annually in the city since 2002, 1,500. In 2006, more than 2,000 Philadelphians were shot, and that was the year that Scott and I started Cradle to Grave. The average cost of a gunshot injury in the United States is $60,000. And the majority of gun victims are uninsured, aren't paying, have no insurance to pay for all of their injuries. Taxpayers pick up about 80% of gunshot injury costs. Now the good news is, is that over 80% of our patients that are shot survive. Now on face value, I guess that would be really good news. Except what Scott's going to show you and what our Cradle to Grave program is all about is that sometimes surviving is not really such a great thing. And if you're paralyzed from the neck down or paralyzed from the waist down or not really being able to go back into society, it's not really great to say I survived my gunshot. If we look at really the cost over years and if we just look at those uh, nearly 1,200 19 year olds that were shot. What is the cost to society during this time period? So if you apply the estimated $60,000 it costs to treat gunshot patients to the over 80% of Philadelphia Again, just the 19 year olds the 1,200 19 year olds who were shot and survived between 2002 and 2011 it cost the Pennsylvania taxpayers nearly 47 million dollars the numbers are staggering. Nobody cares about the numbers. And more importantly, there is, seems to be no moral outrage. Now I will take a moment uh, before Scott starts and, and say that without Scott, I would just be an incredibly frustrated trauma surgeon in North Philadelphia, having all of these feelings and not really knowing uh, what to do with them. And I am thankful that we met and that we are able to do this because I can tell you I don't think I could just go on seeing patients shot every night up there. I don't think I could have lasted all this long. So Scott, take it away. So, um, so when we set out in 2006 to uh, create this program, we uh, knew it was important to try to address this issue on the front lines and not to just wait for people to be injured. A lot of traditional programs uh, tend to wait for people to be shot to then intervene. And I once said to Amy, maybe we should be doing more with these patients. And today we are doing more and more with gunshot uh, victims. But she said at that point, if we wait for them to be shot, we've kind of missed the boat. And that, that was really the mandate that was provided me. We wanted to also look at one of the tough realities of this issue. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about the fact that young African American men in particular, young people in general, um, are being victims of gun violence. But the sad truth is that, in Philadelphia at least, uh, nearly two-thirds of the people who are pulling the trigger are under the ages of 24. And, and that's the, the hard thing that we have to address. Because if we're going to have an impact on this issue, we're going to have to tackle it from both sides of that gun. The good news, if there is good news, if there is a silver lining to this issue, is that most of the time that people get shot in Philadelphia, they will not be re-injured as a result of, of gun injury. And that runs counter to what we assume, but the data supports the fact that about 95% of the time, an individual who shot in Philadelphia is not going to be shot again, at least for a decade. Now you might ask yourself, how is that and why is that? And I, I hate to get all technical and I don't want to get clinical, especially for the young folks, but I will in this instance. The reason it is, is because getting shot sucks. There really is no other way to explain it, that getting shot is maybe one of the worst things uh, that an individual can experience. And we know this, I'll literally meet all of the individuals who are admitted to the hospital, and in my time at Temple University Hospital, 
Um, there have been 4,000 people who've been treated for gunshot injuries just in our hospital, just in North Philadelphia, and just in the last eight years. The one thing that we hear time and time again from the gun patients, these are the two primary sentiments that are expressed by those individuals who will survive their gun injuries. One is that while they're in the trauma bay, they will yell out, I don't want to die, please don't let me die. And that is, it sounds nothing like the, you know, the, the sounds and the, the braggadocio that you hear in, in hip hop culture um, that suggests that I can take it like a soldier um, or that, you know, no big deal. What you hear them say is, I'm scared to death. Um, unfortunately, by the time they go home, they have to rearm themselves, they put that armor back on, and they convey the notion that they took it like a soldier. Um, the other thing that you hear when, I, when you're in the, the room quietly having these conversations with this individual is that when I ask them, is this what you thought it was going to be? They will tell me, I would not wish this upon my own worst enemy. And we wanted to take that message and deliver it to folks before they had to be injured themselves. And so we, you know, we understood that the firsthand experience of being shot is a potent way for victims to learn the lessons attended gunshot injury. The, the problem is that this education is incredibly costly to the individuals, to their families, and to society as a whole to continue teaching it in this manner. So we decided to then bring potential victims and perpetrators as close to this reality as possible so that they might learn its lessons um, vicariously and leave the hospital with a greater appreciation for what it really means to either shoot somebody or to be shot. See, when we're here in this room and we're dressed nice and we're sitting in this polite place, we are talking about an idea, and that idea is gun violence. But I guarantee you, what we have in mind is nothing like what we see inside the hospital. And I think that that's a, a problem. We wanted to tell the reality of this experience. Now, we're not the first people to, to want to tell the hard truth and, and depict this issue graphically, um, or to depict the public health crisis graphically as a way to change attitudes about this health crisis. You might have seen this commercial. Um, it was all over the TV uh, last year. And that's because in 2012, the CDC, which has been reluctant to fund gun violence prevention approaches, decided that they were going to address the issue of smoking. And they committed $54 million to a smoking campaign that had basically the same kind of idea that we had, which is to tell the hard truths about this reality. We've not gotten any money from the CDC to do this. We have very little money to do this. But one of the, one of the encouraging things is that, according to the CDC, as a result of their money that they invested, more than 1.6 million people, as a result of, of showing graphic images, decided to try to quit. And more than 100,000 people quit successfully. We think that that's encouraging. So I want to take a moment to tell you a little bit um, about the program that we do, and then I'm going to turn it over. But I want us to talk about this issue, again, not just in flight terms, but to talk about what this really means. As Amy said, these are not just red dots on the map, but these are people. We tell the story of a young man named Lamont Adams, and we decided to tell Lamont's story because he's a young man that grew up about a mile and a half from the hospital. And he was born December 10, 1987, here uh, in Philadelphia raised by his grandmother who loved this child as though she had birthed him herself. They were constantly together. He was bright, charismatic, he was loved by all, but he got into some trouble with some guys that he had grown up with. We're never going to know exactly what the cause of this situation was. Nobody would ever tell the truth about this, but what we do know is that on September 22, 2004, Lamont Adams, at the age of 16, sat down with his grandmother, Jenny Clark, and as they ate dinner, he took a pen out of his pocket and quietly on a paper napkin, he began to write his final words. Lamont would write the words, Lamont Adams, son of Deneen Adams, and James Edward Mathis is gunned down in North Philly. And he would fold up that note and slip it beneath his plate. And his grandmother, Jenny Clark, as she found this note, confronted him and he reassured her that he was okay, but he was not okay because 24 hours after he writes this note, he will leave the house for the last time. Lamont will leave the house and walk about a block from his house to the intersection of 26th and Cambria, where according to witnesses, he must have heard the footsteps because he'll glance over his right shoulder momentarily before a young man, a young man who's 17 years old, who himself grew up in the very same neighborhood as Lamont, who himself had not a tremendous life up until that point, pulls out a 40, hand, 40 caliber handgun and he shoots Lamont 14 times. 
The reason we want to tell Lamont's story is because we know Lamont's life and we're able to bring Lamont's to life so that as just as you might be feeling right now, the young people have an appreciation for a real life that was lost as a, as a result of a real act of gun violence. We tell that story um, and we walk them through Lamont's uh, case in the trauma bay. The program that we do is a two hour program where they hear Lamont's story, they hear about uh, efforts made by doctors to resuscitate him in the trauma bay. Um, they'll get to see realistic images of gun violence that look nothing like what they see in movies or on television. And they'll engage in a series of reflective exercises that are intended to have them appreciate who loves them and what their lives mean to those people. I'm going to spend just one more minute um, because what I'd like to promise you. Just wait. One more minute. Um, because I would, I'd like you to hear um, Lamont's grandmother. She's one of the people that the young people who come through the program will hear from. Um, and this is what it sounds like. Well, my name is Terrence Wilkins. I'm 14 years old. My name is Patrick Hoff. I'm 14 years old. Today I'm talking to Mrs. Clark about Lamont Adams. Why do you want to participate in this project? Because Lamont was my baby, my grandson. I read I don't want him forgotten. What memories do you have of his early childhood? He had a hard, raspy voice when he was a little boy. There was a song out called, Oh Baby, You Got What I Need. And Lamont wasn't even walking, but he was sitting up singing that song. Can you describe his personality? Lamont loved to talk and laugh. He had the prettiest smile and the whitest teeth. And he always showed them. Mouth always open. <laughs> always talking. He made friends everywhere. People liked him. That personality. Wish I had it. How do you want Lamont to be remembered? Just remember that big smile. That big smile that I'm so crazy about. His last wash is still downstairs in the basement in the handbag because I can't move his things. I go through them. I look at him, but I don't move his things. Sometimes I go in the bathroom, I close the door, and I get down on my knees and I cry. I ask God, why my baby? Why did they have to hurt my baby? They don't know what they took from us. So my, my goal by playing that was not to depress us, but to provide context for what we're talking about here today. Like we said, 19,000 young people have been shot, and a ridiculous number of individuals have been killed. And this is really what this issue about is about. It's not about numbers. It's not, it is about policy, but not just about policy. It's about young people whose lives we, we have to save. The young folks who come through the program feel much like you do in this moment. Um, it's a powerful experience. I don't just say that because I believe in this program, but I know that at the end of the program, I have these young men who are coming to me many times, faces tatted up, and they've been accused of very terrible things, and at the end, they approach me, and they hug me, and they thank me, because many of them, while they've dealt with guns their whole lives, they'll tell me, I never had any idea what it meant to pull that trigger until today. I thank you guys so much for letting us talk to you about this issue, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be here and sharing this time with you. Thank you so much. Well, I'm glad we're here. I'm not glad we're here, but I'm glad we're here. And I thank you very, very much for these very moving presentations that you're sponsoring this. Um, and um, thank you for being together. And I just want to acknowledge my friends from the Educational Testing Service, Walt McDonald, who is a graduate, proud graduate of West Coast. And we're trying to provide positive alternatives to the streets, like yes. your wonderful program that you're here, um, and that you're you're operating here. But I, I thank you. And um, Craver Prison Pipeline is lodged at the intersection of race and poverty, and the United States has never really admitted and dealt honestly with our birth defects. Our American dream is absolutely right in affirming the sanctity of every human being, but we violated that dream in the way in which we proceeded. We chose capitalism, and it was built on Native American genocide, on slavery, and the exclusion of all women from the democratic process, um, and all non profited white and black people. 
Um, and our struggle over the last hundreds of years has been to kind of overcome those, those defects. But we need something that's equivalent to the to the reconciliation process of South Africa. And you can't cure sickness until you really deal with it. But race is still alive, and one of the things that I think is so valuable about this conversation is that mass incarceration and the cradle to prison pipeline, in my view, is becoming the new American apartheid or the new American slavery. And we've got to wake up and see what is happening, because until you confront and understand your history, you will not, you'll be at risk of repeating it. And so this is a very important discussion. Um, and we fought a civil war, we had a post-reconstruction era, um, or a reconstruction era, and then we had a post-reconstruction era, and then we had a civil rights movement, and here we are again, and some of us may fear that we're in the beginning of a second post-reconstruction era. If you look at the patterns of history, and I don't want to be barren, no, I just don't want you to keep alert, keep your eyes open. If you look at the voter suppression measures, you look at mass incarceration, if you look at the fact that 80% of black and almost 75% of Latino children cannot read at grade level in fourth or eighth grade, and how many don't graduate from school um, on time or at all, um, wake up. And, 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 and we're in great danger, and we've got to be alert, and we've got to fight back. And this thing that is lodged at that intersection of race and poverty with the 71 and three black boys, one in six Latino boys to prison, is one side of one piece of what appears to be um, a very dangerous backwards trend, even in the midst of progress in having a black president in the White House. What's going on underneath? And with the money in our system and the control of the political process and with, you know, it's, 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 it's wake up. And so this is a very important thing to do and to understand. And secondly, we've got to come to grips with the, the culture of violence in America because it's been here from the beginning. Um, and you see now, um, you know, the, 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 the rise of NRA. We don't get research out of CDC because NRA block blocks it. And that's one of the big things in our agenda, the Institute of Medicine and others are trying to begin to get, um, you know, a public health approach to gun violence, but, you know, we'll see. Um, but if everybody thinks that NRA will block any significant um, um, research in this area, but we've got to figure out how to do it because it is a fundamental public health issue. Um, but they have blocked that like they have blocked many things. I'm just gonna lay out um, a few just horrible, because we do have to deal with race and poverty and violence, which are historical, cultural things that um, are always underneath the surface and you gotta deal with that. But let's just deal with some of the gun violence facts and you've heard them for Camden, you've heard them for Philadelphia. <coughs> um, but the United States has as many guns as people. America's military and law enforcement agencies have four million guns, our citizens have 310 million. And we know about this constitutional right that's come out even though it misinterprets what the Supreme Court has said. Um, you know, the NRA is back on the rise, and while we are proud in the aftermath of, you know, proud in the aftermath of Newtown and all the things that go on every day because a child or a young person is killed or injured by a gun every half hour. Um, and many of our babies are living in toxic, I mean, they, they are living in war zones. And um, we're far more dangerous than, than being in Iraq or Afghanistan, we'd be much better off. But we've got to deal with this culture of violence. But we, um, our manufacturers, this money, too, American companies manufacture enough bullets each year to fire 31 rounds into every one of our citizens. It's a big business. Um, and the gun manufacturers, and, I, and I, it, 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 a child or a teen dies every 30 minutes or is injured. Um, they die every three hours and 15 minutes, and I just admire the courage of being able to confront this day after day. I have a nephew who's a shock trauma surgeon, and I just, I don't know how you all do it, but, but God bless you. Um, and, um, and I just hope you will hang in there, but we've got to prevent it. Guns are the second leading cause of death among our one 19-year-olds, and the number one cause, as you've heard, among black children and teens. And I just will give one or two more figures on that because I've been trying to say to the black and Latino community, wake up and don't be a victim of folks who are making money at the expense of our values, at the expense of our lives, at the expense of our children. The number of black children and teens killed by guns between 1963 and 2010 
is 12, 17 times greater than all the recorded lynchings of black people of all ages from 1882 to 1968. Where is our anti-lynching movement? Where is our stop these gun deaths um, in our country? And our children are terrified. And our children in America, all of them, are 17 times more likely to die from gun violence than their peers in 25 other high-income countries combined. What is it in our psyche that keeps us killing folks? The number of children and teens has, as we've already heard alluded to, killed by guns in the most recent day of the year was nearly five times the number of U.S. soldiers killed in action that year in Iraq and Afghanistan, and the number of children and teens injured by guns was nearly three times the number of U.S. soldiers wounded in action in Afghanistan. And I will not repeat the figures you've already heard on Camden and Philadelphia. We know what the impact of gun violence is on children, on families, on community. Our children are really just terrified. Um, and they're living in toxic zones and they and we've just got to wake up and we've got to stop it. Nelson Mandela said before his death that we owe our children, the most vulnerable citizens in any society, a life free from violence and fear, and we adults are not doing our job. We've got to have a movement to break this up. We've got to make us confront our culture of violence. We've got to continue to deal with the residues um, and the structural problems of race and poverty in this society. And we've got to create a movement to overcome it. I don't know what it's going to take. I don't know how long it's going to take, but we've got to commit to doing it. Um, and young people are going to be key. And while in the early era, as a child of the civil rights movement, it all seemed impossible, you make the possible possible, the impossible possible, by just going out to do the right thing, begin to raise your voice, and providing alternatives to the streets, and grabbing these children, we've got to have a new movement. And it's going to take courage and persistence and movement building. It's not something that happens overnight. It's not a job for folks who just want to sort of be here. It's not a press conference. It's hard, discouraging work. It's planting lots of seeds, realizing that many of them are going to dry up, that many of them are going to kind of you know, not go anywhere, but you keep planting those seeds, and one day um, you'll see change happen. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge for marathoning, but we are at an era where we have to have that next transforming movement if we are going to be America and if our children are going to find safe havens and realize the promise of this country. So I'm so glad all of you are here, and I'm so glad that you all are hosting us here. And I'll be telling you a story very quickly before I get into what I want to talk about, the culture of violence and the history of violence, uh, of why we got in the cradle prison pipeline. Because I was a civil rights lawyer. And I always understood that being a civil rights lawyer meant more than winning your case in court. And we could desegregate the schools, um, but if the next day your plaintiffs or your people were thrown off their plantations, didn't have anything to eat, you couldn't say, well, I won that case, and just move on to the next case. And one of my favorite plaintiffs, this was my last day in Mississippi, last weeks and months in Mississippi, and anybody who hears me talk about this, hears me talk about May Birth and, and Matthew Carter. May Birth and Carter had 11 children, but they wanted their last eight children to have a better life than they did, and they realized if you didn't have an education, you could not have a chance in this country. And she wanted her children to have a better life, and that's the promise of the American dream, and it's dimming for the next generations coming behind us unless we build this transforming movement that we're going to build together. And she came to me and she said, I want you to sue to let me exercise my right to exercise my freedom of choice, to go to school, to send my children to school, in previously white schools. This was many years after Brown, it was about a decade after the Brown case. Um, and I said, yes, ma'am, Ms. Carter, but you know what this is going to mean. It's going to mean a whole lot of stuff in your family's life. She says, I still don't do it. I want my children to have a better life and not to be like me. And we sued. We won. This was in Sunflower County, Mississippi, one of the most racist, <coughs> mean counties in the Spanish of Hamer comes out of that county. And we won. And Ms. Hamer, Ms. Hamer, Ms. 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 Carter put her last seven children eight children into the Drew, Mississippi schools. And they were the only children in that classroom. And they were absolutely pariahs, and they were um, harassed, but they stuck. Because she said, I pray them here in the morning, and I pray them home at night. And they stuck, and they all graduated from those mean, 
formerly white schools in Drew, Mississippi. They all went on to Ole Miss and the University of Mississippi and became middle class professionals. And, um, and I was so proud of them. And she was so proud of them. And about eight, nine years ago, a mutual friend called me and said, you got to help. I said, what? She said, Ms. May Bertha Carter, Matthew Carter's grandson, is in Parchment Prison. And I said, not Ms. May Bertha's grandson. After all that sacrifice that she went through, how could her grandson be in prison? And indeed he was, and like, you should go through those Mississippi prisons. Average literacy level fifth grade. Um, I mean, you just go through these Mississippi prisons. Four of our young people, and a third of those young people are in there for marijuana use and possession. You'd have to lock up half the country if you were having fair law enforcement. It's a horrible thing, but in one generation, it had moved back. And I just want to say that if we don't end mass incarceration, we don't stop all of these stop and frisk laws, if we don't give our children an alternative path to the future, we're going to have a new American apartheid and undo all the struggles of our forefathers that began to bring about a more just society. So wake up. This is grounded in something different. And we've got to understand that we're really in the fight of our lives um, and giving children hope, but giving children safety. In April 1968, in Cleveland, after Dr. King's assassination, Robert Kennedy spoke about the mindless menace of violence in America, which again stains our land and every one of our lives. It's not, he said, the concern of any one race. The victims are the violence of black and white, rich and poor, young and old, famous and unknown. No one, Robert Kennedy said, no matter where he lives or what he does, can be certain who will suffer from some senseless act of violence or bloodshed. And yet it goes on and on and on in this country of ours. Since Robert Kennedy spoke, he and 1.3 million other American men, women, and children have been killed by guns, and none of us is safe anywhere. And I don't know how much it's going to take to give us that message, whether it's Newtown or Aurora or Columbine, and we just keep going back doing business as usual. This enormous death toll of Americans against Americans and Americans against themselves is equal, in fact, is twice as many as all of the major wars we have fought in all of our history, including World War I, World War II, um, the Civil War. What's, what's, what, what is missing in us that has us continue to kind of do this bloodletting? But most shamefully, this massacre of recent children and the children that we lose day after day to gun violence, um, it just doesn't seem to stop. But it is not new. We get shocked because it's a middle class white kid in your town, but it's a relentless menace day in and day out. It's unreported, it's unreported, and it has snuffed out the lives of countless children, and we've just got to, to confront it. What's happened to us? that we can kind of just take this in to our regular day life and move on. And this morally unthinkable internal war that afflicts our children and all of us becomes routine. Our children 15 are 15 to 17, uh, 17 times, our children under 15 are 17 times more likely to die from gunfire than their peers in 25 other industrialized countries. What is it in America? Um, that makes us so different in allowing this kind of gun carnage day after day, week after week, and year after year, and not even our young children are exempt. I'm going to do a piece in the Huff Post this weekend, maybe next week, on New Orleans, where there is a little casket of a little baby, and another two-year-old is looking over the casket, and a picture of a 10-year-old who we've done called on the class who is have been shot, has been shot twice in the last couple of years. What is it going to take for us to care? And to say enough, and I don't know, and, but I just think we have to keep at it. You keep telling those stories, you keep doing that work, um, and you keep holding these forums, and maybe we're all gonna decide one day it's enough and we're gonna stop it. <laughs> but you know, uh, epidemic child and family poverty um, and, 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 and economic inequality, and racial intolerance and hate crimes and rampant drug and, and alcohol abuse 
um, all kind of feed into it, but we just have a popular culture that also sells violence everywhere. I mean, you cannot cut on your TV, and we need to cut it off. And I know that you've got the internet and all this other stuff, but the message of violence is, is something that's entertaining, and that's what we let it do. It's just, it's everywhere. And again, how do we begin to penetrate? I don't know. And how do we get counter messages? And how do we begin to give children a counter sense of, of what's valuable in life? But I think you put all the things that are going on and the carnage that's going on together, and I think we're in social and spiritual, facing the social and spiritual disintegration of American society that we care about, and then we've got to just figure out how we're going to change that. I don't think there's any bigger crisis that we face, and, we, and it's harder to build movement these days. You can't, with 10 second ads and so many different messages, you can't deal with complexity. <coughs> And, and it's very hard to get a message out, but we've got to figure out how we're going to do it person by person, institution by institution. So thank you for what you have done here today. I can't imagine what God thinks that we let our children in the richest nation on earth go hungry, go poor, go uneducated, go hopeless, and go unsafe. And I think that um, we've got to change it and um, do something about it. What are we going to do? I think that first we're going to have to have some common sense come say to all. It's going to be very hard. The NRA is going to manufacture it more powerful than ever. But let's just go back down. And let's do not go and shop in places that sell assault weapons. And I, I'm not going to, I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I mean, we've never normalized. I mean, I've only been in one Walmart once, past the fishing <coughs> things and the toasters and the whatever. And then you run into these things that kill these children in Newtown. You say, so how can this be that we've normalized, we've normalized assault weapons? And, um, and so don't, don't, don't shop in a lot of places which have these weapons. I've had back that Kmart about 20 years ago. I haven't been back in But we need to stop the normalization of guns and violence in this culture. So don't, 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 don't underwrite them. Um, and wherever you do, and find out a way of speaking out. There is no reason why anybody needs to have an assault weapon. You can have nothing to do with self-defense. Uh, um, and we need to do the facts and understand that you keep a gun, a gun in your home, you're less likely to be safe. But we've got to really begin to confront and understand what's involved here. Secondly, we've got to, as adults, get our act together. We've laid children in youth problems. We don't have a youth problem. We have an adult problem. <laughs> 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 who manufacture, market, and profit from the guns that have turned our neighborhoods and schools and many areas into war zones and the blood of our children into profit. It's adults. It's adults who finance and produce and direct and star in movies and television shows and music that have made graphic violence ubiquitous in our culture. It's adults who abuse children um, on the, more than children abuse each other. And if it's wrong for adults to abuse children, um, and to engage in epidemic abuse um, and to kill the majority of our children, we have got to begin to confront this in our institutions and not turn our backs to it. And adults need to begin to be adults that exercise responsibility and are worthy of, of being followed. And it's adults who have taught our children to look for meaning outside rather than inside themselves, teaching them in Dr. King's words, to judge success by the index of our salaries or the size of our automobiles rather than the quality of our service in relationship to humanity. And you cannot teach children to be nonviolent and we must have serious nonviolence training and restorative justice training. We're still the only country that permits corporate punishment of children in schools, in public schools. Um, how are you going to teach children not to be as violent by being violent? And I grew up in an era where we were beat as children in school, but it is still permissible. We've abolished it technically in prisons, but it still goes on. We are a violent society. Why are we such a violent society? And how do we begin to talk about alternative ways of doing that? And obviously, I hope that the point is clear is that none of us are safe anywhere. I was very moved by a father in New York some years ago who had only one son. And he loved that boy and tried to do everything for him, but he was so worried about Harlem, he decided he was going to move into the suburbs. And he moved with his only child out to the suburb, and with fate would have it, the child became a victim of random violence and was killed. And he was absolutely distraught. 
And um, one of his friends told him that he did everything you could, um, and um, you shouldn't blame yourself. And the father correctly responded, I didn't do everything I could because I didn't pay enough attention to other people's children. We are all in the same boat. None of us is safe anywhere. And it is all in our self-interest to get all these guns that have no purpose other than to kill and hurt other people off the streets. This is not about safety in your home. It is up to all of us to make sure that every child has hope and has a stake in this society. Many children, countless children in America, are dead on arrival economically in America's economy. They are born without prenatal care, without the kind of, often with a depressed or a drug addicted or an alcoholic mother, um, without um, um, parents who are able to meet their children's needs because nobody met their needs um, with, with poor education. So we have got to make sure that every child has a healthy start, that there's prenatal care, that we're providing supports and home visiting, and that we're giving these children a chance to get a foothold in the society. And we had to work on one thing this year, is that we've got to get an early childhood system of high yes. quality in place. Yes. 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 There is pending in Washington, and it has got to be a huge lift, awesome. but we can lift it. Awesome. If we get together and work on one big issue a year, or two years, or three years, and until we get it, the Civil Rights Movement didn't get everything done in one year, because it took me talking decades. But I don't have decades. Before this man came into office, before he leaves office, we should get that $90 billion yeah. strong start investment he's proposing yes. Yes. for a quality early childhood system. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. you now got to enroll them, and all the schools need to be enrolled. And we have meetings with school superintendents right now, Haley, how the schools can help enroll every child in Medicaid and CHIP, but get them a healthy start, get them that head start, which is high quality child care. Do more leaks all over the place. Just do freedom school, give yeah. them something to do after school in the summer. The churches need to wake up, the synagogues need to yeah, wake up and yeah, compete with the drug dealers, and we need to get the drug dealers out of our neighborhoods, provide them positive alternatives to the street. It's so hard if you can't see what you can become. Mm -hmm. And they need to see all the young people who are doing incredible, they're beating the odds of everything. And they're trying to give back, and college students are trying to give back. And so let's make sure that they have summer and after school alternatives, and they need to have service opportunities, they need to have adults. We've got to reweave the fabric of family and community so that children will feel cared for. It's not, they just need to be loved, they need to be respected, they need to know that there's hope. This is about hopelessness. Hope is the best contraceptive, mm -hmm. hope is the best alternative and the best, it's got, hope's got to have meat on its bones and that means jobs. It needs to sense that there's a future out there that you're being educated to seize those jobs. And while I want everybody to go to college, I also want them to go to career. We need to have, everybody can have a job in the richest nation on earth. And we need to be priorities and values of our nation. Get involved in the budget discussion. You go look at that obscene Ryan budget that has been released yesterday. I mean, you gotta give more tax cuts to the top one of what you said. And you gotta yeah. cut children's health. And you gotta cut, speak up. It's time yes. to be really angry, but constructively angry. And just to say, we don't want our children and grandchildren to have to live through and do these things all over again. So my basic <laughs> message is movement time. We have a lot of power in our hands, and we should just put that power together. We know a lot. We know what the research shows. We know it's just common sense. Um, what children need, and we just need to move wonderful models like what you have done to scale. And I can't thank you enough for the leadership that you've been providing and for what this university is doing. But every child deserves a chance to live, deserves a child a chance to be educated, to learn to have a chance to really reach adulthood and to contribute and give back. And that's what our task is. We can do this. The Civil Rights Movement was a miracle. They had far less money mm -hmm. and far less resources and yeah. a whole lot of rate against them. But look what they did with nothing. What is our excuse for yeah. not putting on this next session? So excited and energized after this presentation. I was in tears and then all of a sudden she just picked me up because, you know, this work is about that. And the beautiful theme that came out out of all this 
forums have been movement. We got to start a movement. And you just, you know, just I just heard the word again. And I, I just think that the work that we're doing here in the city of Camden, that we started 20 years ago with Leap and, and the children, it started because of violence. It started because I came to North Camden to do my internship. I'm not here from the city, I'm from South Jersey. And then I went to New York to school, and, uh, and then I went to Boston. And it was when I was in Boston that I was recruited to come to Camden. And I did my, um, my internship in North Camden, and I started a program with youth in North Camden. And I was there for two years doing my internship before I graduated, and one of the kids that I got out of juvenile delinquency, who was just ready to go back to school, and I had spent two years working with him, was shot, and was thrown behind North um, Camden in the 6th and Erie Community Center. I was devastated. I said I was ready then to change the world, and I was so upset in her that I decided to take the train and I was gonna change my life. And I met, I was gonna go back to New York, and in the train, in the speed line, I met the dean, Dean Katz, from here. I didn't know a Jewish guy sat next to me, said, why are you crying? I said, I just lost one of my kids and I'm leaving the city. I can't do this anymore. There was Askam, there was the mayor was indicted. It was a mess here. And I was supposed to be a student of public policy. And he says, I use my card. There's a job open at Rutgers. If you want to really make a difference, go work at the university because we need more kids that look like you. And you know what, I applied for this job as an assistant director. And I came here and I got my PhD. I never left. I've been here for 30 years. But I knew that one of the things I was gonna do when I got my, my tenure, because I got tenure here so you get respected and you get to be allowed to do things. Uh, and you know, I pay my dues. I said, I'm going to start a cradle to college. And I have to tell you, it's been 15 years on the lab. We have a 100% graduation rate. We have the cradle, we have the babies. And you know, when I hear Ms. Edelman talk about the importance of early childhood, I cannot agree further with her a statement about the need for us to begin to think of how we can save our children. And I think that what I did here was something that I just knew that it was so important because the life of the children you know, and I just finished doing uh, my work um, on, on this topic that uh, Lori, and I want to introduce Lori because she's my partner in this project and she's going to lead the next discussion. But I have to tell you about my story because I never tell about my story. Why I came to Canada and why I care so much about Canada is because that kid always is in my head. And so, you know, I've been able to save about 1,300. I think that's a lot. But I think we got to save all the children. And so certainly thank you for inviting me to upscale the work. I'm really ready to do that. But there's all of us um, have a responsibility in this work. And so we invite you to uh, bring your questions and, and uh, be a part of the discussion here. I, do, I just want to let you know that um, Gloria, Dr. Santiago's book, just hot off the presses. This is a book that um, she's worked very hard on to tell the story of the Leap Academy and uh, what it took to try to bring um, her ideas and her passion uh, to a new model of, of education. Um, but one of the things about it, I haven't had a chance to read it through fully, but one of the things I know about it is that um, Dr. Santiago's life story is interwoven in here. We've heard the power of stories uh, today from our panelists. Um, and the story that she can tell is one that in many ways circles back to the themes that we're talking about today. Because she is a child of parents who are involved in the movement, in the farm workers movement, which was part of the civil rights movement. And so as despairing as we can be, to hear these, this, have this frank discussion about the catastrophe of violence in America and what it's doing to us, um, there is another narrative that we have to keep front and center, and that is a narrative about social movements, the importance of the civil rights movement. We have a warrior of the civil rights movement here with Ms. Edelman. Um, we have models of, of, of very dedicated people who are spending their lives working on this, and that's what it does take in the movement. So um, I want to encourage you to pick up the flyer for the book that's out front because, I'll hold it up here, uh, you can go ahead and order the book now, 
And if you do, the proceeds from uh, the book will go to the Rutgers Leap Alfredo Santiago Endowment Scholarship Fund, um, which is part of the whole project that Gloria has created to do that cradle to college model that she has uh, talked about and is exemplified in the Leap Academy. So I want to encourage you again. Um, it's a, a wonderful story. It's part of the effort, I think, to try to begin to scale up a, a model. And um, it's going to show you about the, the deep human uh, commitment of love that is always part of the great social movements uh, that has to be part of what we, we do uh, going forward. Okay, so let me ask um, you to join us now, and I think what we'll do is we'll take maybe three or four questions at a time and let our panel decide how they want to be able to respond to you. We have